Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our final class session uh, on the Book of Lost Tales. Uh, and I am delighted to welcome a special guest tonight. Um, as I've mentioned before, I really wanted okay, to good. make sure that we spend some time in the context of the Book of Lost Tales, Part 1, talking about Tolkien's languages. You know, you guys, I'm sure, have heard it said many times that, you know, Tolkien's language and his, his, his creation, his, 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 the process of creating his languages was a really essential part of the birth of his stories and that, you know, as he, Tolkien himself, describes it, the stories themselves are really rooted in his languages. Um, so we're, uh, yeah. uh, we're, I, I have tonight uh, the pleasure to yeah, introduce nice. Andrew Higgins, uh, who has been, uh, uh, who's completing yeah. his dissertation um, with Dimitri Fimi, and uh, he has been working on Tolkien's early languages and the yeah, beginning of his legendarium. So um, as he's... Uh, Getting his uh, getting his audio sorted out here. We'll get him uh, set in, and he's going to uh, take you through some stuff about Tolkien, the birth of Tolkien's languages, and um, uh, and uh, and and uh, and the early legendarium there in the Book of Lost Tales. So, uh, so Andrew, are you ready? Good evening. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. I'm just trying to get my webcam working. Actually. Oh, okay. Yep. No um, problem. Um, can everyone hear me? All right. Yep. Yep. You're coming through fine, yep. audio wise. So I'm clicking on this button for the webcam. Show my show my webcam right there. Yeah, there should this be a one. webcam button yes. there on the tab right below the microphone. Uh, there, there, there we go. go. And then your screen is that one. And this okay. is my screen. Okay. Can everyone see me? Okay. Can you yep. see me? Okay. Yep. Great. My my able assistant partner Morris dancing <laughs> husband helped me. There we go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> now, in order to see the PowerPoint. I just need to click back on, oh dear, what did I do now? On the screen sharing tab up there at the top. There we go, there I am, and then screen share, the, the, the arrow one. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. We'll connect. There we go. Got Great. It. Okay, I think we've got it. I think we've got it. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I can't tell you how um, honored and humbled I am uh, to be invited to do this because I have been a inaugural Mythgard Institute Signum University attender since day one with Tom Shippey's uh, and Flieger, Corey Olson's, and Michael Jobs Tolkien in the Epic Course. And I think Mythgard is amazing. And for those of you out there who haven't taken a Mythgard course yet or Signum course, I, I urge you to do so because they are amazing. And I think my my journey in Tolkien came in two ways, basically. One was by taking courses through Mythgard, and the second was being very fortunate to take another series of online courses with probably one of our best Tolkien scholars out there today, Dr. Dimitri Fimi, um, who urged me when I was doing my blog to actually stop doing a blog and do some serious research. <laughs> uh, and uh, she convinced me, uh, and I'm so blessed because of it, to actually attempt to do a thesis on J.R.R. Tolkien and focus in on the early works, the Book of Lost Tales, which I've been listening to these podcasts and they've been amazing. Um, and for me, what's really always interests me about Tolkien since the earliest time I bought the Ruth Knoll book and tried to to write my own version of uh, uh, the Shadow of the Past in Sindarin. Sorry, Carl Hostetter, if you're listening. I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> is uh, is Tolkien's languages, and I think I've kind of modeled my own academic life on on Tolkien. I I taught myself Anglo-Saxon and Gothic and Old Norse and everything, really, as based on what Tolkien did. And what I've been trying to do in this research is really get into what he was trying to do with the early languages and how that gets contextualized also with the Book of T Lost Tales narrative. We're very fortunate, thanks to the incredible work of a group of people called the Elvish Linguistic Fellowship, um, who essentially were entrusted with Tolkien's linguistic pages, of which I believe there's about 3,000 of them, um, along with all of the stuff that Christopher did with the Book of Lost Tales, with the History of Middle Earth. Um, and they've been literally going through and publishing Tolkien's early papers on language. And we're very fortunate now that we, we've got most of that early work. So we can look at it and we can study it and contextualize it with, with the text. And that's what I've been trying to do, uh, to understand what he was trying to do with the languages and what he was trying to say with them. 
So I thought, I, I thought I'd just start off by doing a very quick um, background. And let's see if this works. Corey, can you see that? I can, yes, yes. I just want yeah, to let everybody good. know. I'm, if you have questions um, about you know anything as we go along, I'm going to kind of duck out here and uh, uh, and let Andy talk to you guys, and then I'm going to. Um, but I'll be watching the questions box and stuff, so I'll be happy to help to relay any questions you have uh, through to Andy. So please do go ahead and type into the into your yes. your normal questions box um, any comments or questions that you have. So. And I'm happy to stop and take questions and things like that as well. So just please keep typing in and let me start. Okay, I, what I wanted to start off by actually saying is setting a bit of a context for Tolkien's language invention because Tolkien wasn't the first language inventor. And as a matter of fact, he was working from a tradition of language invention in fiction. And one of the things uh, that I've looked at is other past language inventors and what they were trying to do. And the first uh, language inventor that we had for a fictional work was Thomas More, whose Utopia in 1516, and actually the interesting thing about his, I call it a paratext trifecta, because he was the first one to create an invented language for fiction. He was the first one to use maps to kind of outline his fictional island of Utopia. And he was also the first one to create a writing system in which the language for fiction was expressed in the Utopian alphabet. So Thomas More was one of the first, and after him there came a series of what I would call traveler's tales that used the idea of a fictional work to convey a kind of culture, what was discovered on the island, or in one case, in Bishop Godwin's case, the man on the moon, on the moon. Um, and this all culminated uh, with probably one of the first very well-known um, traveler's tales that uses in, or mentions invented languages, and that was Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels in 1726. Gulliver travels to many different islands, and it's a very politically, there's lots of political satire in the islands he discovers, but he also talks about the different languages. And what's interesting about Swift, and Tolkien certainly knew Swift's invented languages, and he actually comments on them in several of the letters uh, and in his Secret Vice, um, talk, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, is Swift was one of the first to use this idea of a phonoesthetic sense to an invented language, that he made a language sound like the culture that was speaking it. So one of the islands that Swift travels to is the Huninim, which are made up, which is, a, is an island made up of horse-like people, and they all speak with nays, and they all sound like horses. Um, so that's something that Tolkien would have been interested in when he was looking at the heritage of language invention. There is also a um, two science fiction works that use an invented language, which are interesting. One is Edward Bullier Lytton's *Vril: The Coming Race* in 1871, that has a full chapter on the Vrillian language, which incidentally uses base roots. And we'll come back to that when we talk about Tolkien. And the other one is a Victorian science fiction work, which actually I just finished reading, and it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating story by Percy Gregg called *Across the Zodiac*. And this is almost like a, it reminds me a lot of Paralandra in a way. It's about someone who gets kidnapped uh, to Mars, not Venus, but close. And on Mars, they discover that the Martians have a full grammar and working vocabulary of a language that gets conveyed in the story. Close to the time of Tolkien, we have Lewis Carroll's last work, um, after he wrote Alice in Wonderland, called Sylvia and Bruno, which is a fairy tale about two fairies. And within that story, there is a mention and actually examples of a, again, phonoesthetic language called the doggy language, um, which sounds like dogs barking. Um, and then finally, probably closest to Tolkien's time, there is the works of Lord Dunsany, uh, especially the gods of Pagana, which were published in 1905, which have invented name for their gods. And the one thing I'll say about most of these that I've studied is these are, um, the invented languages are used almost like reports or kind of commentaries back on what was discovered on the island. The languages are not integrated into the scope of the story. The other thing to just quickly review are some of the language theories that Tolkien would certainly have known about and indeed I think was definitely commenting on in his language invention. And this breaks down into two key language theories. One is this idea that Ferdinand de Saussure, who is the founder of modern structural linguistics, put forth that there is no fixed relationship between the signifier, which is the word, and the signified, the idea. 
So you could take a word, an idea of a tree, for example, and instead of calling it tree, call it Aldar. Um, we decide what those signifiers are signified based on an agreement in our languages of what those different things mean, but they are not fixed. That's very handy for language invention, of course. The other um, emerging language theory that happened around the time Tolkien started inventing his languages was this idea that I mentioned earlier of phonoesthetics or sound symbolism. And that is that there is actually a representational relationship between the sounds that make up a word and its meaning. Words sound like they mean. And I just give two examples here, um, one which was just mentioned in the last book of Lost Tales class um, with the founding of men, the land of Merminalda. Merminalda, it sounds like they're sleeping. And the other one, of course, I like is Moru, who's the dark primeval um, thing that's out there that later becomes Ungolian. It sounds, Moru sounds dark. The other thing that was happening around the time of Tolkien was this rise in the use of and study of auxiliary languages. And these were the attempt to invent languages to create cross communication among peoples. And of course, the most famous one of this, and the one that Tolkien indeed learned when he was an, very young, uh, was Esperanto. Um, as well, though, there are other invented languages, and I would refer you uh, to a fantastic book if you haven't read it already, which is Dr. Dimitri Fimi's uh, Tolkien Race and Cultural History, where she has a whole chapter on this idea of what was going on in terms of language invention um, around the time Tolkien started to invent his languages. So I just want to review, do we want to stop for any questions? Are we okay? Uh, just actually, just, just okay. one quick question, Andy, um, if I could. Um, uh, yeah. Yana Steen Redeker yeah, asks, sure. asks a really good question, which is, how many of these languages, that is, the, 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 those other invented languages you were describing, he says, how many of those were developed far enough to be actually seen as an invented language as we know them from Tolkien's work? Uh, very good question. I think, having looked at a lot of them, they do follow the type of pattern Tolkien followed in terms of creating a basic syntax and some words. But like I said, most of them are not integrated into the story in any way. So the difference with Tolkien, as we'll talk about in this minute, is he integrated his invented languages into the names of people, places, things, etc. Whereas these languages, you know, you're reading about a traveler's tale, and then all of a sudden there's a chapter on the XYZ language that I discovered on the island of Blech. You know, it's that type of thing. Um, so I think one of the reasons um, that they were done as well is they kind of mirrored some of the language invention that was going on outside of fictional works to kind of create the perfect language or go back to the perfect language. And I would refer you to, to a wonderful workbook by Umberto Eco called The Search for the Perfect Language. I've got a bit of a big bibliography at the end here. But he talks a lot about what was going on in the philosophical and scientific communities about trying to invent this perfect language, this Adamic language um, that we were trying to get back to, basically. Did that help? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Hello? Yeah, good. Oh, good. Great. All right. So that so we, so that was kind of setting a context for language invention. Now I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the chronology of Tolkien's earliest language invention, working up to the Book of Lost Tales, and it really starts um, with a language that an invented language that Tolkien encountered that his two cousins, Mary and Marjorie Enclidon, had created. Um, around 1906-1907, Tolkien and his brother Hilary used to go visit their cousins, and they had created a replacement language called Animalic. And all Animalic is, and again, everything I'm saying here can be referenced in Tolkien's talk on language invention called The Secret Vice, which is published in Monsters and the Critics, which is a wonderful essay to read if you want to get into the, you know, Tolkien's mind about what he thought about language invention. But Animalic was what Tolkien called a replacement language. In other words, they just took a word uh, you know, and replaced it with an animal name. And he quotes one line of Animalic in Secret Vice, which I will leave you to look up. Um, but Tolkien didn't like this language, and, and, and actually there's very little evidence that he was involved with it very much, although possibly the name Otter uh, was Tolkien's animalic name because he used it in 
this book of the Fox group I'll talk in a minute. But I don't think Tolkien, he, he observed the language, he saw them playing with it, but I don't think he was very interested in it for that matter. But one of the cousins, um, I think it was Marjorie Inkleden, went on with Tolkien to develop another language, and this was called Nev Bosch, and this is about 1907, The New Nonsense. And what Tolkien starts experimenting with here is using what he called learned languages like Latin, French, English, but he starts playing around with them, and he starts playing around with them from a phonetic point of view. And something to remember, I think, about Tolkien's language invention, there was always a focus on phonetic expression. He was very interested in how the words sounded. Um, so, for example, in Nevbosch, he takes the word for cow, and he turns it backwards, and it becomes walk, um, W-O-C. But then he comments in Secret Vice that actually it also sounds very much like Vosh, which is the French word for cow. So he starts playing around with these ideas, and in Secret Vice there's actually a limerick uh, um, that he, that he, that's published in Nevbosh, and you can see how that works. The diff the, I think, again, with Nevbosh, he was still developing it within a community with his, in terms of Marjorie and Clinton, and it still has a feeling of a code language. It's just words being replaced for words, basically, although it's being done a bit more artistically. The next language is the language that I think was Tolkien's first real secret advice of, of language invention, and that's Nafrin, and he does that around 1908. He does this alone without his cousins, and it stops being a language of a play community of people working, you know, suggesting words and things like that, and it starts being Tolkien inventing a language. And what we see, while we still see some learned languages, especially Latin um, and Spanish, possibly um, because he was looking at a lot of his guardians, uh, Father Francis Morgan's books, who was a Spanish Welshman, um, but we start seeing some what he calls nascent elements, things that don't exactly look like codes anymore, they look like words. Um, and Tolkien very frustratingly publishes in A Secret Vice a little quatrain in Nafrin, uh, but he doesn't translate it, which has been frustrating to many, many Tolkienists, including myself. Um, he does tell us one word, and the word is vru, V-R-U, ever, always. And actually, the, you can follow the through line of that word all the way to the name of Veronwe in the Book of Lost Tales, who, of course, is Ariandel's companion, um, which means the faithful, so ever, always the faithful. Tolkien certainly liked certain sound combinations, and he kind of kept them through his languages, and, and this is one of them. The other interesting thing about Nafrin, and I think this is where myth starts to come in, because Tolkien was inventing this no longer in a community of people, he was doing it himself, this is where I think he started thinking about, well, these languages have to have someone who spoke them, and they have to have some story of the people who spoke them. And so this idea of the tell and the teller and the mind are in, in this world co evolve I think, starts to come in here. Um, and we'll, this builds. The other um, thing that happened roughly around this time is Tolkien also wrote his first invented coded system or writing system in this book of the Fox Root, which was a book, a scout code book, and we now know, thanks to the Birmingham Oratory website, that both Tolkien and his brother um, Hillary were Boy Scouts when they were at Birmingham, and Boy Scouts make codes, and I think this was his, Book of the Fox Root was his private scout code, which he used to express phonetically the auxiliary language of his Esperanto. So by this time, he had already taught himself Esperanto, the, code, the, the invented system, and he was starting to develop a coded system. In 1910, he attempts to create an unrecorded Proto-Germanic language called Gautisk. And the only reason we know this is because the, um, the wonderful editors of the Quenya lexicon, um, in the first couple of pages, include some notes that tell us that before he used the actual notebook, and I think paper was scarce back then, um, to do what will become the Quenya language, he sketched some notes about Gautisk in terms of what it would sound like, that it would have some kind of gothic feel to it, etc. Um, I think, and Tom should be kind of um, uh, confirm this to me in a, in a conversation I would have with him, that I think Gautis was one of those 
attempts that Tolkien started and then just couldn't do any more with. There are there is some evidence that he might have thought this to be the language of Beowulf, and he was trying to create almost the the proto language that. Beowulf would have spoken, but we don't have enough evidence to really go there anymore. Um, the next really exciting thing about Tolkien's language you mentioned comes in October 1914, um, a month after he wrote that first Ariandel poem, when he adapts the story of Kulervo from the Kalivala, um, which has been published in Tolkien Studies Seven by Dr. Virlin Flieger, and is an amazing story. And actually, we've we've taught it on several Mythgard courses here. Um, but what Tolkien did is not only did he adapt the story of Kulervo from the Kalevala, he also went through and invented alternative names for some of the people, places, and things in the original Kalevala story. Several of those names, as Virlin Flieger and Karl Hofstadter have pointed out, actually become early versions of Quenya base roots. Um, for example, he invents the word Kemen for Earth to create the idea of Kemen Nume for the name of Russia. And this comes into the Quenya lexicon as Kemi Palorian, one of the names for the Vala Yavana. So by, by October 1914, Tolkien is starting to think about this idea of creating a language partially based on his study of Finnish and the Kalevala um, from which his myth mythology will come. Any questions there? Do we want to... Hi, Andy. Yeah, one quick question that uh, Brian Fatterini had. Before we um, go on. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, how many languages yes. did Tolkien actually speak semi-fluently? Or was his knowledge less practical and more scholarly, as in a solid working knowledge of vocabulary and grammar, but no real use in practice? Well, I think we know that he definitely spoke some Spanish because of Father Francis Morgan, his guardian, who is friend, uh, Spanish and Welsh. And he probably picked up some Welsh, some Welsh as well. But of course, at this time, he's now at Exeter College as an undergraduate, and he's he is studying, you know, having already studied at King Edward School, Anglo-Saxon, Old Norse, Gothic, uh, medieval Welsh. So he's studying a lot of these languages. And of course, the great discovery for Tolkien came uh, in roughly 1911 when he discovered the Kalevala, the Finnish national epic. And he felt that the translation by W.F. Kirby was too clunky. Uh, so when he came to Exeter College, he took out C. N. E. Eliot's Finnish grammar, which I've got somewhere around here. My own copy, not his. Um, and he started learning Finnish, which w which is, as I like to call it, the Mount Everest of language learning. Having still trying to plod my way through it. Um, and that opened up, as he said, it, it was like a wine cellar opening up a whole new bottle of wine. Um, but again, that was a learned language. So in terms of what he spoke, I, I think we're pretty much sure that he probably spoke, obviously English, um, probably some Spanish, um, possibly Welsh, but I'll have to ask Dimitri Fimi that question, actually. Great, okay. great. Thanks, Andy. Hello? Did I lose everyone? Sure. No, we're here. There's just a, there's a slight lag between you and me, so that's all. There's just a bit of a delay between oh, okay. but no worries. Okay. Okay. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. No problems. <laughs> Where are you? Okay, so should we talk a little bit about myth and language coming together? Because I think this is this is interesting because I think the Book of Lost Tales is really the culmination of this idea of myth and language coming together. And the roots of it can be seen going all the way back, of course, to September 1914, when Tolkien encounters this mysterious word or name, Eriandel, in the Christ poem, uh, the Christ one of the Anglo-Saxon poem. And he starts to wonder, what does this name mean? What is this trisyllabic name that doesn't really sound Anglo-Saxon mean? And he starts to do a mythic exploration of it by creating through poetry a series of stories about the journey of Ariandel. Um, and we, of course, those have been those have been published. He then a month later does the story of Calervo, which I start talking about. And roughly around 1914, early 1915, depending on which source you read, uh, he starts compiling this earliest layer of the Quenya lexicon. 
the next big step in the in the development is in May. Now, th there's an interesting one here, and I've, I've just done some work on this. In May 1915, Tolkien paints a picture in his sketchbook called the Book of Ishness, called the Shores of Fairy. And next to the picture, he writes a very rough draft of a poem of the same name, the Shores of Fairy. In July 1915, he writes a more a fairer version of this poem. And in that poem, we have the first evidence of invented names. And those invented names are, and they'll sound familiar to the people who've just read the Book of Lost Tales, Tenequitil, Valinor, Eglamar, and the name of Ediandel's ship, Vingalot. And you can trace each of those names back to base roots in the Quenya lexicon. So that is really the first time I think that myth and language come together in Tolkien. He starts, he feels confident enough to use those invented, that Quenya lexicon to create invented names that come into the mythic poetry. And that starts a whole series of poems. Not all of them, not all of them have invented names, but we get to November 1915 and the poem that we, I know you, we've read in the Book of Lost Tales class, Cortirian Among the Trees, which not only has the name Cortirian, but also the name, the very phonoesthetic name, Al Al Menore, um, which of course is, uh, would later become part of Warwick uh, in, the, in, the, in the frame. So this is the kind of the progression. Tolkien probably start, definitely started off with myth and language separately, but it comes together, and by the shores of fairy, we have this first idea of invented names uh, for the myth. Any questions on that? Okay, Andy, uh, let's see, no, uh, no new, let's see, uh, I, okay, actually, yes, one just came in. Uh, Noam Weiss was asking, just confirming, so the development was first words, followed by the world around them, and later the history and development of the language? Is that is that a fair s synopsis of the sequence? Well, uh, this next slide might answer that, actually. If I could go to the next slide. When okay, we're talking sure. about Quenya. Good. Yeah, well, actually, because... let me just add one thing quick, then. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, Carl Hostetter, who has joined us for class today, uh, had a I'm very honor to have had a, had a, had a, a quick answer. Also, had something to add about uh, Tolkien's languages. Um, uh, uh, Carl, Carl says that Tolkien can certainly uh, read, write, and I expect rather fluidly speak German too. Um, Carl says oh, he yes. doesn't think that he could speak Welsh, but he could probably read it somewhat. And he says that he expects he was as fluent in Latin as any Vatican state official. <laughs> That's very good. Yes, and uh, Demetra adds that we only have uh, Demetra Femi, who's also here with us live today. <laughs> uh, we have we have like the whole you know council here today. This is awesome. Uh, Demetra adds that we have only one instance when we know Tolkien tried to speak Welsh to a Welsh speaker, but that was quite late, like uh, up in the nineteen fifties. Okay. Right. That's Good. all. You can now carry on Brilliant. to the next slide, and we can uh, we can uh, bring things back to Noam's question from before. Okay, well, uh, let me know if this answers that question, because what this next slide looks at is how the Quenya, the, the, the Quenya language kind of got developed. And really, based on the evidence of the, uh, the Quenya lexicon, um, one of the first things Tolkien did, I think, and Carl, uh, Carl can definitely chime in here, definitely, because he edited them, um, is I think they're the earliest layer of the Quenya phonology, uh, which is included with the Quenya lexicon, established the phonetic system for the language. I, they, Tolkien spends over 25 pages drawing out very, very complex philologic rules for sound and sound com combinations. And through that, at the same time, roughly, I think, he also arranges these base roots. So he invents and Yes, we can trace some of these base roots back to some sources, but I won't go into that. Uh, but there are some possible sources for that. But most of them, as he later said, just kind of came to him. And if there is any before history of them, they don't mean anything. Um, and then from those, he uses um, a series of prefix, suffixes, and infixes. So, for example, I give an example here. This is a Quenya base root, moro. And moro means darkness. So again, it has that kind of phonoesthetic sense. From this, Tolkien invents, and I almost picture Tolkien like 
like uh, what do you do when you do in jazz like improving like you know he just like takes that thing and he just starts adding things to it so you get mori night morinda of the night nightly moriva nocturnal morion son of the dark so the i o n is almost like a, a an ending for sun morwin daughter of the dark very familiar from, from uh, torn taramba morna morqua black Mori Lanta, which he combines with another bass root, a very, um, very famous bass root, Lante, meaning falling, to create this idea of nightfall. Morwenon, Arcturus, or glint in the dark, so now he's using it to signify uh, a planetary thing. Moru, hide, conceal. Morwa, unclear secret. So all of these words have a common base root from which they can be they, they can be traced back to and they all sound the same because of that they all have that kind of phono aesthetic sense of, of of darkness and I think one of the things that Tolkien was very interested in and I think this is where he was almost trying to improve on other name inventors of the past is he wanted there to be a coherence and consistency to his naming system so like unlike Dunsany, who just would you know make up names for all his gods, he wanted them all to have some kind of sense. So when someone saw the word Mori, they knew that that had something to do with darkness. Um, so that's how he formed the base root. And I think he was also, uh, one of the other things he does in the Quenya Lexicon, which is kind of a parallel to what he does in his Lost Tales, is he also creates mentions of other lost languages. For example, there is this very intriguing language called Taletka or Talitka, um, which the shadow people, if you remember the shadow people from Habanon, uh, the poem Habanon um, and Ariadur. And Tolkien just mentions it a, a couple of times in the lexicon, which almost creates this sense, well, it does create this sense of depth, you know, that there are these other languages that existed as well. Um, and while there are hints of a Quenya grammar in the lexicon entries, Tolkien would not write the first formal Quenya grammar to about the 1920s. So again, I think with the earliest languages and with Quenya, Tolkien was very interested in name invention. He wanted to create that system of name invention so they could, as they start appearing in, in, the, uh, in the poetry first and in the prose, and it's a name system that needed to have a coherence and a consistency as you can see with Moro. And I think what some of the reasons why base roots, why did he use base roots? I think one of the things that he was being influenced by were some of the 19th century theories of language, starting with um, philologists like Max Muller, who believed in this that languages started out as, you know, base roots and then were built upon. Um, and there was this search for the Proto-European base language, this idea I talked about earlier of the perfect language. Um, he wanted to improve on past name inventors. And I think there's also something about making them fit into the narrative, you know, this idea of creating this idea of a, of, of a linguistic reality so that these, world, these words sounded like the world that the story inhabited. Um, and he also gives nature, uh, clues to the nature of the words. And I think one of the most interesting things about Tolkien is he, he almost encourages you to learn the language because every time he gives, you know, Tol Arasia, he then says, the lonely island. He translates it, basically. So you have that kind of sense that he wants you to know what those languages mean and everything. Any questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Noam has a follow-up question here. Um, he says, so Kenya has base roots, uh, that is, basic shared sounds associated with meaning, and prefixes and suffix suffixes, but no real patterns, so I can't, for example, use the several base forms with different base roots to get different words? Uh. You can, you can, and I think Tolkien gives a lot of, I mean, there is a consistency to those different things. So, like, for example, if you want to form an adjective or something like that, he does it in several ways, but you can go through the Quenya lexicon, as I have done, and actually look to see where there are similarities in terms of how, for example, he forms a past tense with an N infix. So you can take a ver you could take a verb and you can put an N infix in there and you got the past tense because he's done that several times. Um, but again, we don't, uh, I'll show in the next slide, uh, we do have some samples of Quenya. Uh, he wrote a poem in it actually called Narquilion, which we'll get to in a sec. But in the Quenya lexicon in itself, 
he doesn't write a lot of Quenya. He doesn't give a lot of examples, but he does show how words are formed using different types of infixes, prefixes, and suffixes. And so from that, you can start to get an idea of um, what the language, how the language is structured, and things like that. The Quenya phonology also gives some hints as well. Um, it has a couple of um, sentences. But actually, if you look through the Book of Lost Tales, and I find this fascinating, you don't have a lot of Quenya. There's a couple of lines of actual Quenya in it. Where you find more Quenya and Gnomish is in a lot of the documents he wrote around the, uh, around the Book of Lost Tales, the paratextual documents that have been published by, um, by the Elvish Linguistic Fellowship, things like Days of the Week, The Nameless of the Valar, Creatures of the Earth, that really start to have sentences and things like that. <laughs> Did that answer great, the question? Yeah, thanks. Great. Great. Um, just some other, oh, I, before we go to that, just some interesting points about the Quenya lexicon. Um, as I said, there's also that, that phonoistic nature. Another thing Tolkien does, which is a lot of fun to look at, and I, I urge you, if you, you know, order the Quenya lexicon and go through it, because it's a lot of fun, is he was very ludic and playful with the construction of, the, of his words. And then there's some really interesting ones. Like, for example, he takes the base root saha, which means be hot, and he yields the word, he makes the word sahora, which means the south. But, of course, it sounds like Sahara. Um, you know, so he's, he's making a little kind of joke there on the Sahara Desert. Another interesting one is, and I find this one's really interesting, he equates the word Lemminkainen with the number 23. Lemminkainen is the kind of the heartthrob hero of the Kalevala. He's the young lover, basically. And when Tolkien started working on the Quenya lexicon, he was 23 years old. So it, as, as much as I think Tolkien wanted to associate himself with Kulervo, uh, I think here he's also saying he's a bit of a Lemminkainen as well, which is an issue. Uh, he also mythologizes, mythologizes, mythologizes himself, Edith, Father Francis, and his brother through language invention. There are several interesting entries for a character who very much rec resembles Edith, uh, his uh, first girlfriend and, and then wife, of course. Uh, Arinti is a, is a very good one in that respect. But there's also Amillo, um, who is born in February, which was when Hillary Tolkien was born. So I think Tolkien was being very playful um, with this. And let's remember, this was a private lexicon. They, you know, we don't know what Tolkien wrote with this in terms of publishing. And I think um, there's a wonderful passage in his uh, lecture on the Kalevala where he talks about taking a holiday. And I think Tolkien was taking a bit of a linguistic holiday by doing this lexicon and being very playful. Um, I also think this is uh, a, an interesting one. There's a very dark philological joke with two words in the lexicon, Heklar and Ringel. And if you'll remember in the Book of Lost tells the scene when the Valar asks Melkor, for whatever reason now, to make the two pillars upon which the lights of, of the world will first sit, the first lights before the two trees. And the names that they're given are, that, that Melkor gives them, is Heklar and Ringel. And if you look in the Quenya lexicon, Heklar and Ringel both have to do with ice and snow. So within the names of the pillars that the two lights are going to sit on already is the kind of the dark philological joke that these things are going to melt and, and destroy the two lights. So if you know your Quenya lexicon and you know Heckler, you know that Melkor was playing a joke on the Valar and he, he signifies that in the name. So I just thought that was interesting. And also I think there's some evidence that Tolkien invented some of these words to use in poetry. Um, there's lots of indications of poetic words. And I've done some work to kind of look at some of the early poems that Tolkien would have written at this time and what cor correlative they have with words in the Quenya lexicon. Uh, and it's, it's, inter it's interesting. It's, it, I think he was definitely thinking that way of taking some of those poems um, and turning them into Quenya. Um, and then also he wrote a poem in Quenya and in <clears throat> in a Secret Vice somewhere Tolkien says the highest um, the highest um, progression a language can take is if you can write in poetry. And in late 1915, early 1916 he wrote a poem called Narquelion which means Ordum. And again if you look at the base root of Narquelion it's N-R-Q-R and it means wither, fade, and shrivel. 
and the poem itself, which is kind of the first version of a, of a poem Tolkien would write, I think, many, many times in the course of his Legendarium, is this idea of autumn and withering and fading. And if you look just at the first line, ne alamino la la, sorry, ne alamino la lantila ne sumi la sapinie, the elm tree, so you see the word tree and elm, elm tree, alamino, la lantila, let's fall one by one, so you have that blunt idea again of falling, ne sumi la serpinie, uh, the small leaves, la ser leaves, upon the wind, sume, which is where manwe is called manwe sumilio, uh, which has to do with wind. And then I just gave you the rest of it here. It's actually been published. You can get it in uh, Vinyar Tenguar, which along with Parma Elder Lambaran are two of the must-haves uh, if you're going to do Tolkien's early uh, languages. Um, the, this is where the Elvish Linguistic Fellowship has published a lot of this material. Any questions? I have a quick question, Andy. Could you t um, uh, can we talk for a second yeah. about the, uh, the the sort of the poetic form that he's using here? Um, how does how, in in looking at at his 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 Quenya poetry here? How does it uh, well? How does it work? That is, I mean, I can see there appear to be uh, end rhymes that he's using yeah, in some yeah. of these lines. Um, does he? Do, do you find are there alliterative patterns as well? What kind of poetic structures does he use in in his Quenya poetry? I think I, I've identified that. I, I mean, I think it's it's a b a uh, yeah. I think more work to be done there. Yes, Corey, but I think there is definitely some early kind of alliteration and things like that being used in it, definitely. Right, I mean, just from the look of it, it would kind of look like, I mean, the yeah. second and third line would, yeah. well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, f f uh, of the ones that you have indented there, um, those would seem to, well, they, they're close anyway. Anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, the way that they seem to, to, to... He seems to have some interlocking rhymes there, right? With uh, yeah. uh, Eldamar, Aldar, Almoldar, clearly rhyme, and then the Noldorinwa and Laikwininwa, yeah. those, you know, but then, so you've got the, you know, the, so the, the A rhyme around the B rhyme and then interlocking with the C. So it seems like he's mm. doing, you know, which is not at all shocking based on his English poetry, a pretty ornate interlocking rhyme scheme there. Um, yeah. Are the do, do do the do the lines tend to be consistent syllabically? Like the, the, you know, does does he follow a, a syllabic meter generally? I'd have to go back and look. I'm not sure. I, I know with this one, I kind of scanned it out this way, and it was kind of that interlocking idea. Mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah. I should definitely go back and look at that. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying, uh, here I am. Uh, here I am, sort of putting you on the spot here. But I'm just—I I, I, don't—I don't trust my own pronunciation to read it aloud and really kind of sound it out in my own ear here. So I just, yeah, yeah this is just—I'm—I'm—I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm, I'm really interested. Of course, I mean, as you know, I'm really interested in Tolkien's poetry and, in particular, the way in which um, I just love his his creativity and sort of adventurousness in exploring different, uh, you know, meters and rhyme schemes and lengths of line and things like that. And he's so sensitive to that in English. It looks like he's doing a similar kind of thing, but I was wondering, um, I mean, of course, I know that he was also very interested in other verse forms, such as the alliterative line, of course, which, you know, which he did a lot of work with in, in the Germanic languages and, and, you know, and in places like the Fall of Arthur and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the alliterative um, Children of Hurin, but um, mm. so yeah, so I'm just kind of uh, I, I would be interested, you know, the, of course, for me, one of the things that I'd really be interested in in studying more is the way, sort of the char the, the character of of of, Qu of of Quenya poetry here, and if um, you know what what kind of uh, what kind of characteristics he's giving it. So anyway, well, I'm just kind of you, you, I'm just kind of thinking on my feet here, and, you know, looking. Through you've it. you've inspired me to study poetry more, so I will add that to my list. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just spent about six months getting a alliterative down it down. So yes, I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Roy has a, Roy and Kari Karlinski has a a, a quick uh, sort of follow up question there. Um, he's he's observing, for instance, you know, the apparent phonetic connection, you know, the phonetic similarity between you know that uh, you know alal menor and elm, right? And you've got the L M combination. Um, uh, and Roy is asking, did he actively attempt 
attempt to match Quenya sounds with English ones? Do we see that kind of overlap a lot? Um, or is that just kind of a coincidence with that one or because of, you know, because he felt that Elm, you know, that LM combination already had a fun aesthetic value for, for, you know, what it was describing or. I don't know. I mean, I, that actually, the Elm comes from a base root Allah, which means to spread, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting. So it's, it becomes Al Almino, but if you go in the Quenya lexicon, um, the root of the word for tree actually is Allah, which mm-hmm. means to spread, and then from that he creates Alda. Um, but I, I, you know, like I mean, you can. I think the other thing, interesting thing is the phonoesthetic sense of it, like la lantila. You know, let's fall one by one. It sounds like let's fall one right. by one in a way. Yeah, right. it has that kind of it sounds symbolism to it. But whether he. Uh, again, the tricky thing is, I mean, you can go through the Quenya lexicon, and we there. It's been proven that some words came to him, like one of the earliest Quenya roots, Ono, um, which he which creates gondolin. I mean, it's the word for stone, basically. All owned came to him from a book he read on uh, uh, John Rhys's Celtic Britain when he was about seven years old, and it was suggested in that book that this is one of the earliest pre-English words we have, um, the other one being fern, which I haven't been able to find anywhere. Um, and then he takes that and he brings that into the Quenya lexicon. But he said in a letter later on that whatever history it had beforehand is, is you know, inconsequential. It starts with how I incorporate it. Mm-hmm. So whether he said, elm, um, hmm, yeah, that, sound, that, make, that makes sense, I'll do that. I don't know. I don't know. But it'd be an interesting one to look at, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you know, especially with Allah being the root word there, it's it sounds m- just sort of more coincidental there that it that it worked out that way. Um, but so, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my Tom Shippy now. Yeah, this is my <laughs> <Quenya lexicon>. <laughs> <laughs> I always I, I I always love it when 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 Tom Shippy holds a, a book up to the webcam. That, that's that's always a highlight. So I'm just. I'm, I'm just checking the Allah just to make sure I'm not lying there. Yes, Allah spread, yes. And then from that comes Alda, Aldea tree shadowed, Aldeon avenue of trees. Yeah, so, and then Al Alme, elm tree, comes from that same Allah root. But whether he said elm, Allah, it sounds like, mm, I'll do that. I don't know. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, 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 Carl, Carl, Carl Hostetter has just uh, uh, offered that if time allows and his microphone works, he'd be happy to uh, to recite the poem for us. Absolutely, yeah. I would love to hear Carl. Yes, absolutely. do you want to try man. to pause it? Well, uh, do you want to? Why don't we go ahead and finish, and then we can come back to this at the end, so okay. we don't have a yeah. Just just in case we run into any technical snags, I don't want to have uh, put sure. uh, too long of a of a of a break here in the middle of your talk. But yeah, yeah, let's let's okay. uh, yeah, Carl, if you're willing to hang out with us for a little bit, let's let's definitely do that if we can. Brilliant. Okay. Anyway, so, so yeah, why don't you go ahead and carry on? Yeah, there were a couple other people who were talking about um, uh, sort of other 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 connections, you know, sort of apparent connections like that one uh, between uh, you know Elm uh, there that we were just talking about, um, and uh, and you know w- w- with other language uh, uh, other languages. Um, Brian Fatarini was just talking about. Um, how Murmanalda, you know, reminds him of the Spanish word for whisper, murmulo. Um, but, mm. and, and see there, I, I'm suspecting again, like we were talking about, it's less a question of him making a reference to a particular language and more to, uh, you know, him appreciate him having picked up on and appreciating the phonoesthetic value of these other languages, you know, so that when, um, you know, when his languages as, as other languages are, 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 you know, really trying to convey this, you know, the idea that he, he would have had some of these sort of, th- that basically his own phonoesthetic sense would have been informed by how he saw that happening in languages like Spanish or English or, or these other things. And that I, I, my own suspicion is that some of those kind of, cause I, I've, I've, I've often had conversations with people who will be insisting, you know, like, um, I remember I had this conversation recently with a guy who, uh, um, who spoke Arabic and was just absolutely insisting that Tolkien must have been able to speak Arabic because because of these similarities that he was detecting in some of Tolkien's names and uh, and in these you know words in the Arabic language, he just refused to believe that it could possibly be a coincidence, um, you know, because it was so similar. But I, my own response to that is, I think it's just 
you know, I think that Tolkien himself would probably take that as evidence of, you know, the way that language works, you know, and, and, and in a sense, that kind of mythic impact of language, the way that it is, you know, fundamentally connected to these sort of root ideas and reflects them. Yeah, I mean, and also, you know, Tolkien was a very, I mean, even as a young man, he was very well read in languages. And, you know, he talks later on about the leaf mold of the mind, you know, this idea of what was in his mind. But, you know, you look at the Exeter College notebooks from when he was taking courses, and the man, you know, spends hours doodling phonetic sound shifts. I mean, this is a guy that thought about language all the time, you know. So I'm sure even he might not have known Arabic, but I bet you he must have looked at a book or something that might have had some Arabic in it or something. So you can't, but it's what happened when he, you know, set pen to paper and started thinking about this. And I think that, that all kind of comes to the fore, basically. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So just to talk a little bit about what happened after the war, um, so now, obviously, Tol Tolkien fights in World War I, he, he's discharged, he's in recovery, and that's when he starts working on, in late 1916, the first book of what becomes the first Lost Tale, The Fall of Gondolin, which hopefully, if we do a book of Lost Tales too, Mythgard Academy, yes, 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 please, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll study. Um, but roughly around that time as well, he comes back to the Quenya Lexicon, and he starts working on the Quenya Lexicon, and he compiles almost a separate list of words, which he calls the poetic and mythological words of Eldarissa. Um, and this is a bit of a refinement of some of the words, and they're actually all published in the Quenya Lexicon as well. Um, and through the fall of Gondolin, also, Tolkien starts to think about the um, the exiled elves, the elves that have to leave um, Valinor and everything, and go off into the great war, into the earth. You know the exiles, and he starts to develop another language for them, and he bases this language on um, a similar exiled people in a way, uh, the Welsh, and he creates the language that becomes known as Gnomish or Goldegrin, uh, and he writes a Gnomish lexicon. And interestingly, with the Gnomish lexicon, he doesn't use base roots. It's just a straight listing of words. Um, and he also writes a grammar. And it was published, this is it, for those of this is the Gnomish lexicon right here. Um, and it has a whole separate vocabulary of related words. What Tolkien also does at this time is he goes back to the Quenya phonology, um, the, the earlier Quenya phonology, and he invents almost a core Proto-Eldaran language from which Quenya and Gnomish now derive. And he develops a series of sound shifts that allow words to either become Quenya or Gnomish. So there is a relationship between the two. But what Tolkien wanted there to be is a sense of the Gnomish language being the language of a people of exile, a people who enthralled them to Melko, let's remember. You know, the, this is the language that when Otto Wayfair comes to the Tol Arasia, the Lonely Island, this is the language that Rumio and all of them are speaking. So it's a language after they've been enthralled them to, to Melko and in exile and everything. So it's a harder, harder bitten language. And it's really in the Book of Lost Tales that we have this first linguistic expression of both of this new language system of, of Quenya and Gnomish. And the T Tolkien also writes, as I said, in a series of attendant language documents, um, which have all been published as well, which give more information on that. Around this time as well, as he's working on really the kind of the music of Ainur cycle of the Book of Lost Tales, so we're in 1918-19, Tolkien is working as a, a lexicographer at the Oxford English Dictionary, and he creates two writing systems. Um, the first one is called the Alphabet of Rumiel, an interesting we all know who Rumiel is uh, from the Book of Lost Tales. This actually starts out as a writing system outside of the mythology that Tolkien used to write his own private diaries, which unfortunately are not published, um, and then became incorporated into the mythology um, as this first writing system of the elves. And the second series is a series of runic alphabets, which um, Tolkien invents or, or actually modifies from the Germanic runes of Anglo-Saxon and uh, Old Norse and Gothic. And I think this has a lot to do with his attempt 
which was one of the big thrusts, of course, of the Book of Lost Tales, to link it to a lost tradition of English, or what's become known in Tolkien studies as the Mythology for England project. Um, and these would have either been the runes that Ariel Otto Wayfair would have brought with him to the Lonely Island, or perhaps, given that um, with the Ingle story, they, they might have already been on the island for Ariel to encounter. And I just, I don't know how easy it is to see this, but I just wanted you to see here um, a comparison from the names of the Valar uh, of how the names changes, change between Quenya and Gnomish, and it gives you a sense of the differences in the language. So, for example, Ulmo um, in Quenya becomes Gulma in Gnomish. So there's a change there, a G kind of comes into the name. Melkor in Quenya becomes Belcha in Gnomish. Um, Gnomish tends to have a much more harder consonantal, lots of stops and plosives at the end. Um, whereas when you have something like Orome, um, you, you get Oromaldor, so things get ended. So it gives you that sense that these are people who have been wandering for a long time and the language has been changed uh, in that wandering. Um, any questions there? Let's see, not right away. There might be some uh, coming in here, but I think you can go on. We can pick up those later. I'm almost done. Great, great. And then we could, and then we could talk. That's I right. just wanted to, I mean, I just, I just real, just giving here some um, sources, basically, for people who are interested. And I, I just think studying Tolkien's languages is amazing. I mean, it's just, he, he was, he was such an incredible, you know, philologist and linguist, and how he connected that to mythology. Uh, is unique. I don't think there's anyone else who's ever done it. Others have tried, I know, um, but I think Tolkien was the master at it. And I've got to say that, you know, the, the, now that we have these materials, thanks to the linguist, uh, Elvish Linguistic Fellowship, it's such a great invitation to dig into them. And I think with the, you know, the whole history of Middle Earth, there's so much more that we can be doing. So I encourage anyone out there who's interested to kind of study and, and dig in more. But certainly the Monsters and the Critics and other essays has the two essays, uh, the talks that Tolkien gave on language invention, Secret Vice, and English and Welsh. And then I just listed the first two of the Parma Elder Lombarons. The first one is the Gnomish Lexicon, and the second one is the uh, Quenya Quetzal, the Quenya Phonology. There's lots of others, and if you go to www.elvish.org, you can order them all, um, and I encourage you to do that. There's also a wonderful encyclopedia of fictional and fantastic languages by Conley and Kane. Um, that's just a listing of lots of different invented languages. I can't recommend highly enough for those of you who haven't read it, and I'm sure most of you have, uh, Dr. Dimitra Fimi's book, Tolkien, Race, and Cultural History, Some Fairies to Hobbits. Who, you know, Dimitra and John Garth were the first two scholars to really dig in to the languages and contextualize it with um, with the myth, and <clears throat> they are the masters at it. Um, and then I mentioned Umberto Eco's The Search for the Perfect Language, <clears throat> Excuse me, and then finally, there's a wonderful book. I think it might be out of print, but if you can find it, it's m amazing. And it's called "Lunatic Lovers of Language: Imagining Languages and Inventors" by Marina Marina Yaguello, and she has a really good um, kind of review of invented languages. That's it. I'm done. Now we can discuss. Okay, <coughs> very good. Mm -hmm. You know, one um, one question that I had. <clears throat> you know, Andy, sort of thinking about some of the other, both thinking about stuff we've been looking at in the Book of Lost Tales, especially thinking about the way we've been looking at Tolkien's use of myth uh, in the Book of Lost Tales, and you know the way in which you know he's he he seems to be so much more interested in doing those sort of myth of explanation. You know, this this concept of 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 myth as sort of getting back to the root of things, even in ways which he then you know later on in his career rejected as 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 silly or absurd. Um, he he always being so much quicker and harsher to reject his earlier thoughts than I am, of course. <laughs> uh, but. Um, you know, and I and I was I was reminded of that when you were talking about the base words and things, and looking at the root words of uh, of some of these. You know, just the whole, the the way in which the language is 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 centered on those base concepts. It gives to me this this this. Well, I don't know. I was just wondering what you think about the parallel. Um, you know, between the idea of 
of of myth and you know the idea of those of those of those root words um as as a kind of you know, like myth behind the language almost you know like that mm. that there's this there's this one central thing which which is which is which has not even necessarily a definition so much as like it is a mythic concept and then that mythic concept mm. is manifested in in the language just as a mythic idea gets, um, you know, sort of embodied in story or pointed to through story uh, and through and through mythology, you know. But that, but that deeper concept of of what is being pointed to that that can't really just be spelled out and said, you know. That th- th- there are some, you know, there's there are some things that have to be conveyed in story, you know, in myth, yeah. and um, and I think that um, it just sort of strikes me that. There doesn't seem to be in Tolkien's th- any any sort of story equivalent exactly to you know those 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 base words those root words uh, in the language that it's almost as if like the in, in the language itself he's able to convey that that mythic or embed that mythic concept within the language. Yeah, and also I think Tolkien used the lexicon. I mean, there's several cases in the lexicon of names of. For example, flower fairies, things like that, that don't come into the Lost Tales. I think he was thinking mythically as he was inventing the language. Um, and there's and the other thing I'll say, there's a wonderful kind of series of roots that kind of create this idea of Aryan, the word Aryan, um, which is tied up with this idea of the shadow people. And I think what he was trying to show there is where we get our word Aryan comes from actually comes from the echo of an elvish word that was transmitted to men through the elves. Um, so he's kind of trying to create this idea of language transfer. Again, is that why do we call it Aryan? Why, you know, what is the reason for that, basically? It's because it goes back to this elvish word um, that, you know, that's in the lexicon, basically. But I think he's also trying to show what words mean. You know, he's trying to create that sense of there's a sense to that word more, you know, there, there's a, there's a fun aesthetic sense and there's something about it, you know, there's a there's sense to it. Just like, you know, Ashnag's, debatical Ashnag's Gimbatul sounds very different from I Lori Lanti Lasarin, you know, I mean, it's two different kind of sound sets, basically. Right, 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 right. To quote, oh, I, oh God, I just did the ring in skirt. Oh God, hopefully things didn't get very <laughs> <That's> dark. <right. laughs> Do not utter the. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, 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 Roy is saying it. You know that uh, that he thinks it it sort of harks back to the mythic power of names and words too, like the name of God in the Old Testament. And of course, you know there are many places where you can see that the you know to to utter something's name is you know to to name a thing, um, is uh, yeah. is really crucial. So there does seem to be that idea of. Um, um, you know, of 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 name being uh, being fundamentally tied in. See, you know, this is one of the reasons why you know you're talking about uh, de Saucer and the you know the signifier and the signified, and there always seemed to me um, the, a sort of sense in Tolkien's uh, in Tolkien's work and possibly in his languages, almost a kind of resistance to that. You know, that he did seem to posit some kind of, especially with the emphasis on the phono-aesthetic stuff, some kind of actual connection <laughs> between language and things, rather than a purely yeah. conventional connection between uh, between words and things. Um, I just, you know... Yeah, and I also... Yeah. I, and I also think for Tolkien, cre- creation was naming. You know, I think they, they were the same. You know, I think there's somewhere I can remember. I think it's in Dur- one of the the poems um, about Durin's day. You know, before things were named, before you know, there's nothing before naming basically. And for Tolkien, the name came first. You know, and the story followed, as he, as he said basically. Right. Um, yeah. And I think he embed. I think the other interesting thing about base roots is he embeds the story in the name. So Narquelion, the base root already has the sense because he created it, you know, he created that sense that it means withering and, and all that. It creates the sense of what the word means. He also reverse engineered, I think, um, historical philology. Mm-hmm. You could trace these words back because he started with base roots, right. you know. Um, so in a way, he was mirroring what 19th century philology was trying to do, which is finding what those base roots by first creating them and then creating, a, and, and Tolkien was very interested in how languages change over time, real or feigned, and he shows through all of his linguistic work how these words change, but how you can trace them back, you know, to a base root. Yeah, yeah. Um, a quick question about that. Uh, Brian Federini had another question, um, and he's, he's uh, uh, using the illustration of the name Feanor. 
Okay. And mm. he says, okay, you know, the Silmarillion gives the translation of Fanor as Spirit of Fire, right? Spirit of Fire, But yeah. in the, uh, uh, in the uh, appendix in the Book of Lost Tales, it translates Fanor as Goblet Smith. Yeah, that, I, that's very interesting. Yeah, it is. I know. Uh, and I know. So, so basically, the, his question is, you know, uh, how, is there a way that we can kind of trace the trajectory, you know, for this particular name? Can can we see where Tolkien, you know, in the same name, right? He's kept the same name, and yet clear, it's, it seems clear that sort of the language has changed around it, right? <laughs> you know, that's no, it, very funny. I read that just I, when I was rereading the appendices. I saw that and I said, Damn, I've got to look in the gnomish lexicon and see how he gets <laughs> goblet smith from Feanor. Right. I, I, I still like the fact that in the gnomish lexicon there's a word for grail, which means ring. I'm not going there with that one. That's just, you know, just, I mean, that's a paper at some point. But I don't know. Yes, uh, but, yes. But I, I, I promise I will look that up because I find that fascinating. I underline that. I was like, oh, my God, I never noticed yeah. that before. So, so, so uh, yeah. where are you going to go to look it up? In the gnomish, I was going to look in the gnomish lexicon, okay. actually, okay. just to see if there was a fey anor. I mean, if there was anything about goblet or anything. Um, so if you look at fey, uh, nothing. Uh, Faltha. No, I don't see. Uh, we're going to have to do some work on this one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. have no idea how that becomes goblet. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, and or, uh, nope. I don't know if Carl has any ideas on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's great. I, mean, I know this is one of the things that, and again, it's 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 another one of the questions that I often get. You know, people saying, "I'd like to learn more about Tolkien's languages." Like, where do I go to find the answers to these? You know, where wow. can people go to sort of learn? Uh, you know, learn how to you know, sort of start to try to puzzle out these riddles themselves. Well, I think the interesting thing there is, because when people ask me that, I mean, I think one of the best things to read on Tolkien linguistics is Carl Hochsterbe's, um article, Elvis as, El, sorry, not Elvis, Elvish as she is spoke, because what Carl talks about there, I think, is the fact that you, there, is no, there is no one language to learn. I mean, mm -hmm. Tolkien, I don't think, was interested in creating a complete grammar, and let's remember Tolkien modeled a lot of his languages on kind of the grammars he used when he studied language. He would start really well with the phonology. He'd get into the cadence a bit. By the time he got to syntax, he was on to something else. So do we have a, a complete verb form in Quenya? No. I mean, and so what happens is, you know, there's a certain school of Tolkien linguistics that then take that and build upon that and kind of fill in the gaps. I'm not a big fan of that kind of thing. I, I think what they do is great, but I don't think it's Tolkien's work. So I think what's more interesting for me about Tolkien's language is studying what Tolkien was trying to do by tracing, by with all these languages. Not say, I want to learn, I want to be able to learn Quenya for, for fun and profit in two months, because I don't think that will ever happen. Right. Um, right. Jim Allen's book is probably, which, is, which came out in the 70s, I think, uh, Jim Allen's book about the Elvish languages uh, is probably the most complete kind of grammar that you can get around Sindarin and Quenya. But there's still a lot of things that we don't know. And there's also a lot of things I think Tolkien changed. You know, right. Tolkien would get up in the morning and he would just sketch a new past tense for something, you know. <laughs> right. So you have to kind of decide what period of Tolkien's linguistics growth you want to study. Yeah. And then you kind of study that, and you realize there's going to be contradictions, there's going to be changes. Yeah. I mean, what's wonderful about the Parma Elder Lombards is they not only give you the text, they give you all the alternative notes that Tolkien wrote in the columns and the side, and, and, and it's incredible, you know. Yeah. But to kind of build out of that, okay, I now know Quenya, I can speak Quenya, Mm. I don't think that's what Tolkien was interested in. Right. So, so you don't uh, you don't think there's there's really any future in trying to write like a traveler's guide in Quenya? You know, like how to order lunch <laughs> in Quenya, and you know the, the various conversational People gambits like you that you can use. You know, it's, it's yeah. yeah, probably yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still holding. I'm hoping to. I'm hoping his Manish language of Taliska actually has a grammar and a vocabulary that you can write something in. But I'm. I'm. I, I have my doubts about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah.
but there's a lot to there's a lot to study. I mean, and and, that, and when you study Tolkien's languages, you study, I think, how languages work basically, and how right. how languages grow and change, right? And how that works in terms of peoples and things like that. Right. Yeah. No. It is. It is fascinating. I agree. You know, it's one of the things that I, you know, keep coming back to in trying to answer people's questions about the books and stories. Is you know, uh, the, it's it's sort of. Uh, less exaggerated, you know, in a sense, but but exactly what you're saying about having to kind of decide when in Tolkien's life you're talking, especially when people are asking, you know, questions about Silmarillion things, you know, so often the answer to the question is, well, you know, there's one answer to that, you know, in 1920, and there's one answer to that in 1930, exactly. and there's a different answer to that in 1950, and, um, and you know, it's it's, you just have to kind of um, you know, so usually what I, what what I normally do when I'm trying to answer a question is just sort of say at the beginning, like, okay, here's the answer according to the published Silmarillion, like basically, you know, be, accepting that as a frame. Here's the answer to the question, here's but to try to try to try to recognize that, yeah, these things, these stories were certainly sort of living things over Tolkien's life that he kept coming back to, and uh, uh, and and the languages obviously were something that he never really. Um, left behind and certainly never finished um, no. in that sense. So yeah, I know it is. I know it can be really frustrating to people who just want to, you know, who just want to learn Quenya, you know, um, yeah, and and, exactly. and know it as if, um, yeah. And it's 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 hard. It's hard. Yeah, I yeah. mean, one of the things that I, I'm interested in is looking at because I think, and you 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 pointed this out with the Book of Lost Tales classes. I think the Tolkien who wrote the Book of Lost Tales. You know, th these are much, um, I mean, look at the Valar, you know, just yeah. the character yeah. of the Valar. Yeah. They're much more out there. They're much more raw. And I, I would love kind of as a project in the future, in the near future, once I get my thesis done, uh, is to look at how the languages change over time. And does that reflect Tolkien refining himself linguistically as he kind of refined himself narratively yeah. as well. Yeah. Do we see more of a kind of raw, kind of primitive, primitive is not the right word, something use of linguistics in the early Book of Lost Tales stuff, and there's that change by the time he gets to the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And by doing that, you'd have to look at several chunks of, you know, and we have a lot of this thanks to the, all the publishing, of the, of the, you know, of Gnomish, Noldoran, Sindarin, etc., and how it all changes. I mean, that would be quite a project, but I just it would be interesting to see, did he refine himself as he refined the narrative as well? Yeah, it would be fascinating to look at that. Because, yeah. I mean, I think you can, you know, you can look at... Um, you can look at the Book of Lost Tales, and you can look at the Lay of Lathian, you know, and you can look at, you know, the the you know the nineteen thirty Quenta, and 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 these other things, and um, get, you know, you can look at the the, the you know the unfinished uh, uh, tour and 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 Turin stuff from the, the the stuff that's in unfinished tales that he was doing in the fifties, right? You know, so to look at sort of another yeah. another layer of that later on, you can look at these things and see different, you know. Ways in which the stories are shifting, right? You know, th th there's there there are some sort of different sensibilities there. There are different different tones, um, you know, different different styles, even different genres, you know, that he's applying to these things. It would be really fascinating um, to be yeah. sort of looking at that in conjunction with looking at the changes in the languages and to see, you know, what kind of um, what kind of you know are, are are there ways in which we can see those things kind of changing together? Are there ways in which we can um, you know, we can really kind of gain insight from um, from looking at how those two things were sort of proceeding together. I think it's really, uh, I, I think there's, yeah. there's there's a lot to there's a lot to do and a, a lot to look at there. Future uh, projects, future projects, future <laughs> pro huge, <laughs> uh, practically undoable future projects, yeah, uh, or <laughs> or future community projects for many many people, perhaps. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 But. Um, yeah, cool. Um, well, let's let's uh, if uh, if if he's still uh, available, let's let's bring Carl in and see if we can. I would love yes. to hear uh, hear the the, uh, the 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 poem there in Quenya, and then you know maybe if uh, he has a couple minutes, we can uh, we can we can ask him uh, some of his thoughts about some of these things too. Absolutely. Um, so see, uh, Carl, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute your mic here. Let's see. Okay, your mic is on. Let's see if we're able to hear you. Okay, can you hear me? I can, yes, very good. Oh, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is such a special, oh, yeah. uh, an unplanned treat for us. 
Well, thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoyed listening in. Yeah. Um, how'd I do? How'd I do, Carl? Pretty good. I got a few notes to send you. <laughs> okay, good. Pr pronunciation mostly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm working on my my Kali Valer and Kulavo. Thanks to Viral and Flinker. But <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah it, I, Actually, <laughs> before I get into the poem, I I, I did want to make a comment um, regarding these the desire to sort of speak Elvish. One of the things that I've always found really ironic uh, to put it nicely, I guess, is that the early lexicons are so frequently ignored mm -hmm. except as a source for vocabulary for later what the, are called later forms of the language. If you really want to see Tolkien in his fullest, nearest, I want to create a language people can speak mode, this is it. Um, yeah. Partly that's because at the time he was writing this, he imagined it set in more of a medieval world where you have you know, an Anglo-Saxon mariner, so it's you know, later ages, and also you see the influence of Christianity and such, which of course, in in the later version of, of the Middle Earth mythology, um, everything is set long before Christ. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, here in the lexicons, you get all of the useful words like butter, salt. You also get all <laughs> the words for naughty bits, and you know, uh, every but everything that you could want. It's really it, it, it's sort of similar to the way the mythology at this point was much freer and more exuberant. The vocabulary itself at this point seems to have been as well. So, I really think it's it's sort of gotten short shrift, um, and that's why I'm glad to see people like like you, Andrew, you know, actually working with this material in a serious fashion. No, it's fantastic um, stuff. There's lots of really good, really good stuff in there, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, and, 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 and perhaps now that we have intimated that you can go to the Gnomish lexicon in order to learn dirty words uh, in Tolkien's language, perhaps that will help inspire further scholarship. Yeah, they're all there. <laughs> um, I think I've got them highlighted, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as far as uh, Narquellian goes, um, I did want to. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, question came up about the verse, uh, the, the meter, rather. Yeah. Um, one thing to note is that the poem, as we actually have it, as it survives, is 20 lines long. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know that that was all that Tolkien intended to write. And I can actually partly make an argument that maybe he intended it to be longer because. If you look at the verse structure, it actually kind of reminds me of Petrarchan sonnets, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. certainly the first 14 lines are divided into, or could be divided into, an octet followed by a sestet. So you have, uh, you have eight lines, actually it's two verses of four lines each, followed by a verse of six lines. What follows that is a verse of four lines and then a verse of two lines. Now it might be that Tolkien intended it to stop there and that was just, you know, for emphasis or whatever. But it also might indicate that perhaps it was supposed to continue on beyond that point. Um, hmm. Tolkien was notorious for not finishing things after all. Right. Uh, yeah. I'd also observe that uh, kind of unusually, I think, um, certainly for the Quenya, uh, poetry in, in, in any form of Quenya, this is rhymed, it, and it is iambic. Um, so, and the the verse the verse uh, the rhyme scheme rather is a little bit complex. You got in in the first stanza of four lines, it's a a b b, and then the second one is also a a b b, and then in the third verse of six lines, it's a a b c b c. So you see this sort of a. a uh, hinge point in the verse where the rhyme scheme gets more complicated right. and then it goes back to A, A, B, B and ends with A, A. So, I'm all that to, said, yeah. here's what it sounds like. Um, excuse me, I'm a little rusty, but I'll try my, I'll do my best. Nalalmino <laughs> lalantila, ne sume la serpinia, ne sangar voro umeai, o ikta ramavoite malinai. I lintui linduva la selanta, pilinigue suira nala quanta, kuluva ya carnivalinar, ve matte cinque eldemar, san rotser simpetala pinque, sulimar ya sildai hi swatimpe, san serilla terialdar, lilta lie nolarima, oma lingua lira maldar, cinquitala laiqua ninwa, nalalmino ya lanta lase, Torwa pior ma terase, tukula sangar umeai, oite rama voite carne ambarai, 
ai lindoria la selanta vierme mintia nare quanta that's the end brilliant wonderful fantastic now uh, Carl, you said that the the rhyme scheme um, or the, the the this this kind of use of rhyme scheme rhyme scheme was unusual in Quenya poetry. Yeah, actually, I mean, if you look at um, the Marie, for instance, yeah. which is other than this the longest Quenya poem we have extant, it's right. not rhymed at all. Right. Um, hmm. I think later later in life, Tolkien sort of moved away from rhyming poetry. Well, I can't say that entirely because Elbereth is rhymed. Right. Um, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It's That's interesting. Yeah. It. Uh, I'm. What I was most struck by listening to it was the kind of the kind of rhythm. There are certain this you know certain syllables that really stand out. That is because so much of it is um, you know sort of flows on. It's it, it's you know it, it gives a very sort of enjammed sense. But then there are mm-hmm. a few of those times when those you know lines that have. Um, you know that have hard stops there in the middle. Uh, and if you could put it, put the text that you had back up there again for a second. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, yeah yeah it's like the, the I, I was particularly yeah. struck by the the uh, mate um, cinque eldemar when you said that um, there were more pauses like there was there was almost a cesura in the middle of that line. Um, in the the rhythm was just you know that. Was 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 very pronouncedly different. It seemed than than the lines around it in that way, and it's 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 wow. it's interesting. It sort of seems like there are these there are these particular um, words, you know, with the with the uh, with the ate sound there, um, mm. and then yeah. the, and then the and then the q, you know, the the inqui after that. Um, it just that line is just one that again, hearing it really jumped out at me. Yeah, well. The reason I pronounce it that way, there is actually a, a little typo in, in Andrew's text there. There oh. should be two, <laughs> two T's in ve mate, mate, and that yeah. both uh, T are pronounced. Right. So that's that's why it comes out with that, what you hear. Right, right, yeah, which which makes that even more pronounced, yeah, mate, therefore, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, there are no silent sounds in Quenya. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And Carl, that idea of, you know, it being... That this version of Quenya being a kind of more uh, kind of parallel with the Book of Lost Tales, a roar kind of primitive sounding. That well, primitive is not the word, but a kind of it, cha- it doesn't change. Exuberant is a good word. Yes, I mean when you compare that to the later Quenya, I mean can you can you trace that idea of sounds changing and becoming more refined? That's a good question. Um... I bet you could. My instinct is that if you could and you sat down and you looked at the sound inventory, you would see some sort of distinct shift. But it's not a study that I've made myself. Mm. It does, mm. I mean, Quenya at this stage, certainly in this poem, sounds more sing songy to me than yeah. Quenya at a later stage. And that might have something to do with Quenya becoming more of the, the elf Latin and used in ritual. I, I, it's just how, you know, how Quenya gets repositioned later on, too, as being more a language of. You know the elf Latin and all that and everything. It's just it's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, sure. Um, mm. Were there um, were there variations in the, the 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 metrical form of the lines as well as the 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 rhyme scheme? That is, you know, the the uh, the iambic pattern that we see here. Did that fade also later on, or does it remain iambic? Do the do the line lengths vary greatly? Is that for me or for yeah for, for you, Carl? Okay. Carl. Um, we don't have a whole lot of Quenya, uh, Quenya poetry right, right, right. by which to make a judgment, but certainly with um, with Namardie, it is somewhat iambic, but there's quite a bit of variation in the number of yams in a line. Um, verse or rhyme doesn't seem to play any part in it. I almost think that it's more um, quantitative right. verse. In the classical Latin sense. Well, that's what I was wondering. That's what I was starting to yeah. wonder about. That, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think it's become that by that time. Right. But yeah. I'm not an expert mm-hmm. on poetry, so I. No, right. don't quote me on that. Oh, that's okay. Or if you no. quote me on it, note that I qualified it. <laughs> right. Right. No problem. Well, actually, you want, uh, you I want to get this one. Uh, right, okay. Right. Early Elvish poetry. This is a, this has some good, 1920s poetry in it with uh, Elvish poetry. Great. Yeah. Great. 
Yeah. Well, the 1920s were such a fertile poetic period for Tolkien that it's not surprising. Um, uh, actually, Demetra has just uh, 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 asked a question or sort of posed a theory. Um, she was wondering about the, specifically about the shift from, from, from rhyming poetry to non-rhyming poetry. And she was asking, is this part of moving with the times, um, you know, the lack of rhyme in later poetry? You know, that, you know, when Tolkien started as a late Victorian or Edwardian poet, you, know, you did rhyming, mm-hmm. right? But by the time of The Lord of the Rings, rhyming poetry was almost dead. Um, you know, is, d- would we see it sort of progressing in that, in that way? Uh, is that for me again? Sure, Carl? sure. Okay, uh, I, I think there might be something to that. Uh, I I doubt that Tolkien would bow to sort of cultural peer pressure like that. Mm-hmm. But certainly, I mean, we know he's fascinated by alliterative poetry, which does not accept incidentally rhyme. Right. Uh, I'm sure that that his his growing interest in and work with alliterative poetry probably influenced. Um, if there was a, a trend away from rhyme, it probably influenced that somewhat. Right. Um, and Carl, don't we know uh, when he was in uh, ar- around this time, he took some books out of the Exeter College Library, like Keats, Shelley, Romantic Poets. Right around this time, he takes out a series of books, and I just wonder if that had any, if he was reading up on that or something for this type of poetry. That's a good question. I mean, I know yeah. his his English poetry at this time certainly. I believe all rhymes. Right, that's what I was just thinking too. I mean, we certainly seem even later on, you know, uh, in the poems that he composed for the Adventures of Don Bombadil, um, there's plenty of rhyme there. In fact, we still see him being um, really playful with his rhyming as well. I'm thinking in particular of the of the uh, the 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 really short line comical cat poem that he wrote that he included in the Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which I um, which I believe to be a late poem. so we can still see him clearly not only using rhyme, but manifestly delighted by rhyme, uh, right. in that in and, and, and delighting with rhyme, obviously in that poem. Um, what but, I greatly uh, regret is that we don't seem to have any elvish alliterative poetry. Um, mm-hmm. We know that it existed because he makes it pretty plain that the Narni Hin Hurin was in alliterative poetry, but right. we don't have any elvish examples of it. Right. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, on, on a similar subject, uh, 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 Noam Weiss was asking, I guess for either one of you, um, are there are there any gnomish poems? It There's depends. A, uh, where, go ahead. No, go, go. no, you, no well, you go ahead, Carl. It depends where you draw the line between gnomish and older, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, arguably, uh, one of the poems in The Secret Vice is in gnomish, or certainly what Tolkien would have called Noldren at that time. Early Noldor, or excuse me, early Gnomish, the Godolgren period. I'm not aware of any any verse from that. No, I'm not either. No, I think it was just that between Noldor and everything. But I don't think there's anything. And the um, the um, the Feanor one is mainly Quenya, isn't it? The um, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Sequente Feanor. Sequente Feanor, which is in Parma Eldalumbar on 15, I think. And that ha- yeah, that's mainly that's mainly Quenya. Another vexation I'll note is, although we have this massive, relatively massive vocabulary from this time and some pretty extensive grammatical notes, we still don't really know for sure how to translate either Narquellian or Sequente Feanor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Chris Gilson has made a valiant effort on those, but um, there is still a lot of it is, is just conjecture. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, if Tolkien doesn't provide a translation, there's a very good chance that whatever we come up with will just be conjecture at some level. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I went through and I tried to do a correspondence between the words in Sequenta Feanor and actually in the lexicons, and you could see where there's lots of gaps, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Keep digging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks everybody for uh, for joining us today. I know we've we've uh, we've uh, kept on going. It's uh, starting to get uh, late over there uh, in 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 London, Andy. So, you know, oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, I thank you for joining us. And Carl, thank you so much for for jumping in. As I say, what a what a what a delightful uh, uh, surprise that was. Thanks. Thanks very much Carl, for your that, generosity. Thanks for the opportunity. It was brilliant. I work upon your shoulders, so it was brilliant <laughs> for you to join us. <laughs> yes, well, keep uh, it up. 
Uh, yes, I was teasing Andy before we started. I, I right right before we began, I, I saw your name on the list, and I was like, "Hey, look, Andy, Carl Hostetter is here today," and he Hello. was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> it was like uh, like the day uh, the day that I was giving my first Tolkien presentation at uh, Kalamazoo several years back, and uh, and right before I started speaking, Tom Shippey came into the oh. room, and I was like, "Oh, great!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt with Carl. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I have much the same Tom Shippey story. It was at Oxford in '92. Oh yeah, yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful, and thank and and Demetra, glad you could be here too. Thank you for your uh, for your comments as well. Um, and I'm getting right back to work on my thesis, Demetra. I promise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way. Um, uh, Meanwhile, and, and this should not surprise me at all, while we've been talking about other things, um, uh, Mythgard student Alyssa House Thomas has been uh, uh, busily digging away and trying to solve the Fanor question. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> she, she said she I know she has the lexicons. I know she has the lexicons. <laughs> yeah, she, she, found a, she found a reference uh, on, I think it's the Parma uh, Eldambariana, page uh, 11. Uh, no, it, volume 11, page 35. Uh, uh, 35. Fionaur, F-I-O-N-A-U-R. Uh, uh, derivation of Fion, F-I-O-N, bowl or goblet. Let's see. Uh, yep, yep, I see it. Fion, yes, bowl yeah. or goblet. Bowl or goblet. Or deleted in ink. And then he makes reference to Fion, wait, yeah. To Fionway, right, and it's and it's in the entry for Fionway that the reference appears in uh, in in the Book of Lost Tales appendix. That's right. Yeah. So bull or goblet, and then he deleted the or in ink. So just bull goblet. Bull goblet. Yeah. 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 There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so and then so right. at least we can leave without that 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 unsolved mystery uh, on solved. our on our consciences. <laughs> we can all sleep better tonight knowing that. No, that's excellent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks for that, Alyssa. Anyway, as I said, thanks for joining us. Thanks for to, to Demetra for her comments, Carl for uh, spontaneously joining us, and uh, and Andrew. Thanks again for your presentation. I oh, am. My it, it is one of my own uh, 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 greatest uh, greatest weaknesses and uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 you know personal. Regret Regrets that I have studied his languages as little as I have. It is just not something that I've ever really been able to, to dedicate the time to. But it's certainly one of my own greatest, uh, uh, greatest sort of desires and aspirations. You know, in continuing the rest of my life as a Tolkien reader to be able to get into the languages more. Um, so I really appreciate you guys coming to. Uh, uh, to help us out with some some background, helping people to understand uh, the languages that are here that are un that are underlying the lost tales that we've just been discussing, and uh, yeah, as uh, Andrew was pointing out before, of course we choose the content of the Mythgard Academy classes based uh, on a democratic process. Uh, you know, the, uh, the those who have supported the academy get to vote in the books that we do. So uh, if people want to do Book of Lost Tales uh, Part Two, we we can do that. Uh, we will just have to uh, have to uh, lobby among the uh, the electorate. Uh, for that, so we'll see. Um, but very good. Great and tales, very great tales. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. The big ones. <clears throat> so, um, anyhow, so we will. Um, uh, we'll be moving on, uh, as I said, again, uh, due to the will of the electorate. Uh, our next class will be on Frank Herbert's Dune, which we will be starting in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow, um, <clears throat> at our normal uh, non- Europe friendly time. <laughs> Andrew, my apologies. Uh, at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> um, so I hope you guys uh, will be able to join us for that. And thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night now.